crypto is like this kid growing up. Uh, the Bitcoin came out of a, a bit of a revolution, right? In China and in India, we might actually hit them. So. <laughs> Welcome to Block Show 2018 Europe. I'm here and we're speaking with one of the members of Consensus. So my first question to you, Ajit, is if you could just talk to us a little bit about what Consensus is and what your role is there. Sure. So, Consensus is a <clears throat> is a venture production studio based in uh, based in Brooklyn. Uh, now we have offices in London, in, in about thirty countries, including London, uh, Fran Paris, uh, South Africa, Australia, Singapore. So we're building <clears throat> teams all over the world uh, to essentially develop uh, blockchain based solutions. And we create a lot of startups. So we are technology builders and we are creating tools, components, infrastructure, and solutions for a decentralized uh, ecosystem. So in, 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 if I had to put this in one line, we create uh, technology for insided marketplaces. Right? So what that means is that today, uh, in, in the old world, people, Everything was dominated by centralized platforms like banks or you know the likes of Facebook. Mm -hmm. They all dominate either data or assets and uh, start uh, become rent-seeking participants in the economy. Uh, we want to shift that to a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, paradigm where the individual is empowered. And we think technology, especially blockchain technology, has a big role to play in creating an ecosystem where we do not uh, depend on uh, uh, these dominant intermediaries in every single market yeah. for information and assets. So do you have any projects at Consensus right now that you're really excited about, that you're <coughs> developing, that are maybe close to mass adoption? So it, it'd be very, very difficult for me to not be excited about some of our projects. Uh, so uh, blockchain is early stage technology, mm -hmm. right? But at the same time in the enterprise space, we have seen a lot of progress. Uh, so we are uh, act, uh, actually working on a project with uh, some very large financial institutions uh, that we can't I can't announce right now, but uh, it, it, uh, that that's tremendously exciting. We are mm -hmm. working on uh, infrastructure components, like you know, Truffle mm -hmm. is the most popular development tool in all of Ethereum uh, development community. Uh, mm -hmm. Then MetaMask has had one million downloads. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a wallet. Uh, Infura support can support up to 12 billion transactions a day, which it's for read-only transactions, and takes a lot of uh, load off the Ethereum, uh, the public Ethereum blockchain. Uh, so, the, uh, the, so infrastructure tools like that are extremely mm -hmm. exciting. My focus is on decentralized exchanges and regulation and policy. So decentralized exchanges are peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces for exchanging digital and digitized assets, right? So let's say, and what that means is that historically we've had centralized exchanges for the most part, right? Where things like NASDAQ or NYSE and so on and so mm -hmm. forth or Deutsche Borsa in uh, uh, next door uh, that are uh, very efficient in terms of providing liquidity, but then uh, are not so great for low liquidity assets or for a, a wide range of digital assets that need uh, sort of this peer, peer discovery for exchanging. So we, we are working on this next generation decentralized uh, exchange platforms. We are working on crypto custody. Uh, so Trustology is our platform for institutional grade crypto custody that will be that will go live end of this year. So mm -hmm. if, I mean we have 40 plus projects. Uh, we have a blockchain for social impact uh, project. We have a venture capital arm now. We are creating a lot of uh, ventures in partnership with enterprise customers. Mm -hmm. So we are uh, we uh, in in some sense our role is to unleash this entrepreneurial spirit or energy of the whole blockchain community, whether it's the enterprise community or the crypto community, and these are all starting to converge. I come from the enterprise space. I worked for Goldman, Barclays, UBS, PwC, so some of the most uh, established institutions and the kind of intermediaries I talked about. And I uh, sort of bring the whole power and uh, this innovation in the crypto ecosystem to institutions and legacy. So my role is to help some of these institutions understand what's going on in crypto and how they can leverage this technology to participate in this uh, decentralization revolution, so to speak. So my next question is two parts. 
The first one is what made you leave working at these intermediaries and go to the crypto space? And the second thing is, I noticed that I cover a lot of news of this Wall Street exec now works for Coinbase, this Wall Street exec now works for X crypto company. Do you think that's like a theme we're going to keep seeing in the future with you kind of being one of the examples? So uh, I can't speak for everybody's motivations, right? So on one hand, uh, some people are excited about the growth of the crypto ecosystem. Uh, and, and that's perfectly honorable and great. And uh, some people are excited by the sheer amount of wealth that's flowing into this ecosystem, and that's perfectly honorable as well. I'm an engineer. I came from uh, technology and uh, did some work in consulting and regulation. Uh, in the process, I met Joe. Joe is the CEO of Consensus, and Joe has something about him. So he, you know, Joe is, a, is an inspirational figure. He has this ability to excite people about uh, this future, like this mm -hmm. decentralized internet and then this decentralized and sided marketplace uh, idea that we're building in so many different sectors of the global economy. And uh, this whole uh, thing about being able to build something, something that's futuristic and, you know, so a lot of large institutions want to innovate or companies want to innovate, but they have the innovator's dilemma. They are tied to mm -hmm. what exists today and they are scared of disrupting their own businesses. With consensus, there is no such thing, right? Consensus is, exists to create uh, new things. Consensus uh, does a lot of experimentation. Consensus is purely focused on innovation and that's what uh, made me really excited about consensus at this time because uh, if you have an idea and if you have uh, you know, a team and you can actually make things happen, then consensus is a great place uh, for people to go and we are hiring right now. Um. The next question involves, I've noticed on your Twitter, you've been tweeting a lot about the new GDPR EU privacy bill. Yeah, I have like, strong views on that. Including right. a tweet of, the, of a refrigerator giving a family a privacy update notice. Right. What do you think about that? Could you expand on why you've been tweeting all about so that? So GDPR is well-intentioned, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, it was uh, it partly, our current privacy regime is outdated, that mm -hmm. we know, right? So, so there, uh, that privacy regime needs an update. We know that as well, because now we have Facebook and we have Google and we have lots of these data intermediaries, right? Central monopolies that are taking everybody's data and selling ads back to them. And might even, and, and as we found out from Edward Snow, and might be giving their data off to the governments for yeah. surveillance. So, and uh, the NSA using public data for surveillance was a major political issue in various parts of Europe, especially in Germany. Uh, and to, to some extent, the GDPR was a well-intentioned response to that. But if you look at how the regulation has been written, then it's uh, it has some significant uh, uh, flaws, or at least uh, you know that 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 regulation needs a little bit of uh, uh, adaptation to the technology that's emerging because uh, what we don't want to do is because of the need, because privacy isn't the only need, mm -hmm. right? So privacy is a very, very important need. And, but then there is also, uh, the Europe needs to remain competitive against other jurisdictions. We need to create great technology. We need to make sure that our economies are competitive against uh, China and India and the US and so on and so forth. We need a technology ecosystem in this, in this continent that's competitive. So now GDPR runs the risk of being too restrictive Right and sort of disincentivizing innovation, whether it's innovation in AI, you know, data analytics, machine learning, blockchain, and so on and so forth. So the way the regulation is written uh, is is very confusing to a lot of technologists mm -hmm. today, and there is no legal precedent. Right. So for example, we have a right to be forgotten. Now, what does that mean in practice? So if you, if I used to be a consultant for banks, right. So I mm -hmm. did a lot of consulting for banks, and uh, at PwC, and now if you try to actually delete data, customer data from a bank because of GDPR, there are 10 other regulatory requirements that prevent you from doing that, right? So in practice, in theory, it sounds fantastic, but in practice, GDPR, implementing GDPR is, is really hard. Now, uh, and it can actually make uh, people very concerned. So Parity, who have a KYC mm -hmm. utility uh, pickups, which is very popular with the uh, ICOs, mm -hmm. is uh, had to stop the service because now they're really concerned about GDPR, right? Now, on one hand, you have KYC and AML regulations, 
and you definitely want to have KYC and AML uh, regulations, uh, ICOs comply with all of that. And now suddenly we have to stop a very useful service called pickups because of GDPR concerns, because there is a lot of legal and regulatory uncertainty. These guys don't want to be in legal trouble because they're offering a great service, right? So, so uh, because right now there is a lot of uncertainty. There's no legal precedent for mm -hmm. GDPR. We don't know how the various courts will rule. And GDPR doesn't protect you from governments. So the UK government has cameras on every street. Yeah. And and there is no protection for that from GDPR. There is a bunch of derogations, right? Or the or they might uh, governments might enforce a backdoor uh, on encryption, and there is no protection from that. There is no protection from surveillance by governments. So GDPR has significant limitations. It may actually not be able to protect privacy of individuals to the extent that it aspires to. But it is definitely well intentioned, and it's a response to the. Uh, so I think what will happen is that over a period of time, uh, uh, policy makers and uh, regulators and uh, technology providers will all work together. So we are, we are working on a project uh, with the European Commission. It's called the EU Blockchain Observatory. Mm -hmm. yeah, and we that. invite uh, ecos you know, all the blockchain ecosystem participants to engage in that process. And at some point, policy makers and regulators will adopt GDPR to this new and exciting technology that's coming up. But until then, there is a lot of confusion and, uh, and uncertainty in the marketplace. So going off of that, the regulatory uncertainty that exists has led to a lot of confusing regulations that have, you know, in China, there's been um, a lot of bans that have caused com companies to move right. to Hong Kong. In India, the central bank um, ended all crypto dealings and that's been right. sued and it's been going back and forth. Could you comment on any of that? I mean, you mentioned the blockchain observatory. What other steps could be done to stop these kind of yeah, so so it's it's a uh, uh, regulatory approaches around the world uh, are rooted in their culture, mm -hmm. right? So I wrote a, a little bit of a humorous article about this on on Finextra. Uh, so for example, when we talk to kids uh, on on the at the dinner table in the U.S., we tell and they're not behaving in the U.S., we tell them to go to their rooms. In China and India, we might actually hit them. So, <laughs> so crypto is like this kid growing up, and regulators are like these parents who behave in ways that are attuned to their culture, right? So I, uh, now, what? Uh, so some of these are knee-jerk responses from regulators around the world because, uh, so for example, in China, mm -hmm. there was a, a Communist Party Congress just before Bitcoin was banned, banned right? And yeah. people, uh, the governments didn't want social instability, and there was a very uh, bullish market that could have caused a lot of problems for individual investors. So a lot of these things that regulators are doing are well-intentioned. Mm -hmm. But part of the challenge is that the crypto community hasn't really engaged with policymakers. We haven't tried or invested in educating. So initially, uh, the Bitcoin came out of a, a bit of a revolution, right? We were rebelling. The crypto community was rebelling against uh, the chancellor's bailout. And, and it came, uh, Occupy Wall Street was the theme. So, mm -hmm. But now that kid, rebellious teenager has grown up a little bit. And it's time for us as uh, technologists to engage with the other processes of the society, such as regulation and policy, and work collaboratively, help regulators understand what's going on, help uh, governments understand what's going on, educate ourselves on why the rules are the way they are, why the securities laws are set up the way they are, and then maybe find this uh, ground where we can the technology can develop and create the fairer world, but at the same time without causing some of the issues that might occur if we are not responsible in using this technology. Great. That was my last question. So thank you so much for coming thank in. Thank you so much. Thank you so much Cheers. for attending the show. Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe, and hodl.